Mm -hmm. All right, and we are recording. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you to the Meridian Library for hosting this webinar on Hobby to Hustle, how to get started selling fresh produce. Uh, I'm Ariel Agenbrod. I'm an area extension educator in community food systems and small farms with University of Idaho Extension. My office is located in the Ada County Extension office in Boise on Glenwood near the fairgrounds, but I serve uh, the greater Southwest Idaho region because when we're talking about a food system, we're talking about all the places where the food that we consume is grown, and that encompasses a pretty wide area in the Treasure Valley. So I was asked to come today to talk to you about how to move from being a hobby gardener to actually growing and selling produce, fresh produce. So this uh, talk is really a series of questions for you and also a little bit of a checklist, right? There are a few things that you have to think about in terms of your personal readiness, your financial readiness, and uh, maybe even your educational readiness and to, to do this sort of thing. So are you ready to make the leap? Maybe you've been a great gardener for years and you think, you know, I'm tired of giving away all this extra produce. Maybe I could make a few bucks by, you know, selling it and maybe, maybe doing what they're doing down at the market. So here's some questions for you as to if you are ready to make this leap. I enjoy growing fresh produce, right? You have to enjoy what you're doing and like doing it. Otherwise, it's going to be a chore. Uh, I can consistently grow high quality products. So this is important, right? If you wanna get top dollar for what you grow, you've gotta grow stuff that looks and tastes good and that can compete on the shelf with other produce. Not that, you know, farmer's market customers Customers are always looking for perfect produce, but they do want it to look good, to be appetizing, to be the right size, uh, not under or over. So that high quality is really important. Uh, I have enough room to grow. So you know, if you have size constraints, your uh, market is only going to be so big, right? And your ability to produce is only going to be so much. Uh, I have researched my market. This is really important. And this is a really key first step before you plant. Um, too often, we actually do get calls from people that say, uh, I have all of my crop is ready. Where do I sell it? That is not the time to be asking that question, right? The time to ask about what you're going to sell and where you're going to sell it is before you even plant. Make sure that you know that there is going to be a market for what you want to sell. And really importantly too, especially when we're talking about fresh produce, a lot of people grow fresh produce. What is your niche? What is special about you, your farm, uh, your produce? What is going to be your selling point, right? And can you talk about that really clearly and make that case for why you should have that customer? So if you're ready, if you're able to answer most of these questions in the affirmative, then I think we're ready to go to the next step. So what you want to sell, how you want to sell it is going to make a lot of uh, impact on just how complicated or not it's going to be to get started. So all of these things have different kinds of rules, regulations, or policies surrounding them. And so to figure out what it is that you want to produce first, it's going to help you to figure out what else you need to know to get started and to get started in a way that is legal and safe and, and doesn't cause headaches later on. So probably one of the easiest and most simple things to grow and sell is raw, uncut, fresh produce. You know, like this picture here of these carrots and these beets and the greens behind them. You know, you grow it, you pull it out of the ground, you give it a little shake and you take it to market. Uh, we're gonna talk about what, uh, what things you might wanna consider, but for the most part, this is pretty entry level, easy to get started with. Now, say you wanna grow organic produce, right? This is gonna need a little bit more thought and a little bit more planning. Uh, if you want to grow garlic for food or seed, there are some rules and regulations, particularly around garlic. Maybe you want to grow the plants. You know, you, you much more prefer growing plants than the vegetables. Well, that's fine, but there's another layer there. Uh, cut flowers is, again, another very simple, easy access way to get started. Uh, there are very few regulations related to cut flowers, so that's another good entry-level crop. Uh, maybe you want to grow seeds for sale. Again, there are some things that you'd want to consider and you'd want to talk to somebody that's growing seeds pr um, professionally because there are some rules around the distribution and sale of seed. Um, maybe you want to sell any kind of processed cut or frozen produce, and this would even be things like, you know, cut up um, greens or cut up carrots in a you know, plastic container. 
This is going to be actually quite a bit more complicated once you get into a food product. Um, even if it starts out just as fresh produce, if it's been altered in any way, it starts to become a food and there's rules around where and how you can sell those. And then maybe you're thinking you want to sell a value added food product. So maybe you make a really great carrot cake um, or maybe carrot muffins or, you know, jam out of the fruits that you grow. So again, these it's totally doable to sell them, but there's things that you have to know and things that you need to find out before you start. So today we're really going to talk about the produce. Um, we're not going to get into some of these other secondary types of crops, but certainly it could be a topic for another presentation. So where do you want to sell? Again, this answering this question is going to help you to determine some other things that you're going to have to figure out ahead of time. Whether you're going to want to sell directly from your farm or your home, whether you're going to sell through a CSA or community supported agriculture. This is a method that some people are very familiar with. It's new to others. It's basically a subscription service to your farm, right? You sell a share ahead of the season uh, to a number of folks and every week they get a share of what you harvest. So they're taking on a little bit of the risk and the reward of the farm. Uh, this is a great way to get some of your operating capital up front, uh, but it also takes quite a bit of planning to know that you're gonna have something to give them every week, right? A farmer's market is often another great way to get started, especially if you have a farmer's market that allows for a one day walk on um, without committing to the whole season, especially if you don't yet know how much you're going to grow or whether people are going to like what you grow. So uh, that can be a great option. Uh, multiple farmers markets, maybe you've got a big family or you've got employees, you're going to sell all around the valley. That can be another way to sell. Maybe you want to sell to a store, right? Maybe you want to sell to the Boise Co-op or um, you know, to another small market. They're sometimes uh, eager to buy local produce, but again, you got to figure out um, how you're going to make that happen. They're going to have some particular requirements too. And maybe you want to sell online, maybe as simple as just posting on Facebook when you've got a whole lot of lettuce that you need to move, or maybe you actually do an online storefront, you take orders and make deliveries. So again, that would be a little bit more complex. You'd have to figure out the e-commerce part, uh, make sure that you were able to receive and process those orders and, and have enough to sell. So lots of different ways that you might want to get into selling produce, but again, each one is going to take a different set of skills and a little bit of preparation. So when you do sell directly to the consumer, you get quite a few benefits as a farmer. Uh, when you're selling direct that you actually capture more of the profit because you don't have a middle person, a middle agent working you know, to buy from you and sell to someone else. You are selling directly to the person who's gonna be that end consumer of the food. It can reduce some of your risk because you're really dependent on your customer's loyalty. You set your prices. You're not really subject to fluctuations in the market. You certainly have risk that might happen. You know, You could have a cold snap or an insect problem or something like that, but you control your market. Um, and it also allows you to develop your unique product identity and put your brand on something that you sell. When you sell wholesale, it maybe goes in, it gets mixed with all the others and your identity is lost there. So direct marketing can be really beneficial. However, I do like to always point out that there are some, some skills and some knowledge that you are going to need as a direct marketer. And some of these can be learned and some of them really helps if you're born with it. And probably the thing that matters most that you be born with it is that you're a people person, right? You can learn a lot of these other things. You can go to classes, you can go trial and error, but if you don't like people, you're never going to be super great at selling direct to consumers, right? Unless you do it all online and maybe you're fine without, you know, without that direct face to face. But really to sell direct and be very successful at it, you've got to, you're selling that relationship. You have to have people skills. Marketing and promotional skills, the ability to, to you know, paint that picture of your farm and to sell things and put them in the best light. That is a skill. You can learn it though. Uh, if you're going to be using social media to either promote your product or you're going to be using technology to sell, then you have to have those kinds of skills or you have to have someone close to you that does have those skills and it will work for tomatoes, right? Um, if you, This is another thing that you can learn, but it's really going to be key to your success 
is being able to grow good food, right? So having that production and gardening knowledge and experience, being able to manage multiple different crops, the timing, um, and get them planted, harvested, and sold at the right times, and to be able to consistently produce quality products. Because like I said, farmer's market uh, customers, they're willing to accept things that look a little bit different or different colors or maybe a little bit bumpy, uh, but they're still looking for produce that is appetizing, looks healthy, um, is not damaged and is, a, you know, of the most delicious size. So no baseball bat zucchinis at farmer's market. So what kind of business will you be? Again, this is something that's going to take some thought maybe with your farming partners or your family. Each one has a little bit uh, bigger layer of complexity in terms of being able to set it up yourself. Um, they have different um, uh, repercussions as far as taxes go and things like that. So knowing your business structure, are you gonna be a sole proprietor? Are you going to be a sole proprietor with an actual registered business name? Uh, maybe you've been doing this for a while and it's time to turn into a limited liability corporation or a full corporation. And then if you're going to have employees, again, more complex, right? More things to manage, more things to keep track of. And now I am not with the Small Business Administration. This is not really my strong suit, but I do know that we have a lot of resources out there and especially free resources that can help you to figure out some of these things and find uh, the person that can help you put it together. And I have included some resources at the end of this presentation to help you get started. So where else do we begin? So let's start with the what, the growing produce, right? What are the rules, regulations? What are the things that you need to know to get started? And I wish that this was a gardening talk. It's really not. So I'm not gonna talk about actually getting growing because the idea, right, is that you already know how to grow okay. Now you wanna sell it. And again, if you really wanna learn about growing produce, maybe that's a talk for another time. So number one, can you legally grow on your property? In most cases, um, and in most zoning jurisdictions, it is legal to grow food on your property. It may not be um, encouraged to grow food in your front yard, depending on what your zoning is or on what your, um, your neighborhood association, if you have covenants or CCNRs or restrictions. Um, it's good to find that out first before you start to rip up the grass and invest in tools and plants and things like that. Um, now, I went through, this is another thing I'm not really, really good at, but I did my best to go through some of the Meridian City codes and look for anything I could find that would either limit or permit these sorts of activities in different zones. And I couldn't find anything um, directly addressing growing of food crops on residential properties. So the good news is I didn't find anything that uh, strictly prohibits it. Um, but unlike Boise, where they've codified some allowable activities regarding urban farming, I was not able to find that. But that doesn't mean that it's not there. It just didn't happen for me in my cursory view of the code. However, I did find um, addressing beginning a nursery or an urban farm in many of the other types of zoned properties in Meridian, so um, commercial or industrial. It was certainly an allowed use, uh, and there is some code language in here about that. So again, I would probably just check with your neighborhood association, make sure that you're not in violation of anything um, if you are to be growing on your, on your own property. Now we get to sales, that's a little bit different story, um, but for right now, just uh, the growing part, probably okay to grow on most types of property. Now, again, you get out a big tractor in a residential neighborhood and you start plowing up, somebody might question what you're doing. So just uh, take some time to explore that with your planning and zoning commission. So you find out that you can grow. There are no restrictions on what and how you can grow on your property. So what comes next, right? The selling of produce. And maybe you're already growing more than you can handle and that's why you're interested in selling. So let's move into that. So to sell anything in Idaho, you are subject to sales tax, right? Um, and so in order to sell, you must have a valid sellers, seller's permit. And there's a form IBR1, or there's a temporary seller's permit if you're not going to be selling all the time. And I'll go through the differences uh, on that in just a second. But you must have this valid seller's permit um, and be able to collect sales tax, file a sales and tax return, and forward the tax to the tax commission when you sell goods in Idaho. And that includes produce. 
So a, tail, a sale is the transfer of ownership of any tangible personal property or providing certain taxable services in exchange for payment. So tangible personal property is anything you can feel, see, touch, weigh, or measure. So food is one of those things. You can see, feel, touch, weigh, or measure it. And if you're new to Idaho, the current Idaho sales tax rate is 6%. So I know a lot of growers who just factor this price into their product so that they can sell in nice round numbers that people can make change for. And then they withdraw that tax uh, from their proceeds and sell. Others will name a price and then they'll always just add 6% on top of that. How, how you do that is entirely up, for, uh, up to you, but you do need to collect sales tax and submit it to um, the state if you're going to be selling. Um, and then all retail sales in Idaho are taxable unless specifically exempted by Idaho or federal law. And then again, if you are selling to a, a documented non-taxable entity or a nonprofit, you need to keep documentation of that because they do not, um, they're not subject to sales tax. So you got to be thinking about that. But most of the time, that's not going to be a problem unless you're selling to a school or something like that. So how do you get that seller's permit? So they've made it pretty easy for you. Um, most of this stuff, actually all of this stuff is online and very easy to use. And I know through the library and through the Small Business Development Center, you've got lots of people that know a lot about it, computers that can help navigate some of these things. Um, it's not always super clear and easy, but it is on there. So you can complete the Idaho business registration application. And this is for your permanent sales um, permit. And then there's also a temporary sales permit that you can get also um, on the state, um, the state website. So if you apply online, you get your permit in about two weeks. And if you mail your application, you can take up to four weeks to get the permit. And uh, when you are selling, you need to display the permit in a visible location at your business. And when you register, you'll also get instructions on how to collect and file your return. So that's really a nice thing, right? That information is going to come to you. And then you can file your returns online or with personalized forms that are available to you. So they do really want to make it as easy as possible so that you'll do it, right? So which permit would be the best fit for you, whether it would be a regular seller's permit or a temporary sales permit? Uh, well, let's look through this. So there's no fee for either one. So that's nice, right? You don't have to pay to get into business, uh, at least with the sales tax um, permit. Your regular sales permit is going to be permanently valid unless you cancel it. It's going to be valid for unlimited events or times or you know places where you're going to sell. Um, but you do need to file regular periodic returns and you must file even if you don't make any sales once you've got this permit. So if that sounds like something you want, you would get a regular seller's permit. Now, if you want a temporary permit, again, there's no fee. It's valid only for a temporary period. So maybe like a seasonal market. This is a, a one that often farmers market vendors will get, uh, but then you would have to reapply for it every year. Um, it's valid only for that one event. So that's not just the one Saturday. It would be every Saturday of that farmer's market. But if you wanted to sell for like at that farmer's market and then you wanted to sell at another evening market or at a bazaar or something like that, then it wouldn't transfer. Uh, and then you do need to file your return within 15 days of the last day of the event. So, you know, if your market ends in October, it would be, you know, late October that you would file. And you must file again, even if you made no sales. So again, if you're selling just on your farm um, or direct to consumer throughout the year, you might want to consider the regular seller's permit. And if you're selling at only one farmer's market, uh, then you might consider the temporary seller's permit. And especially if you're just thinking, I'm just going to try it out this year, I'm going to sell at one farmer's market four times, maybe just get a, a temporary pup permit, but it's up to you. Now, what if you want to sell from the farm, right? What do you have to think about with that? So this is something really important. And again, I am not, um, I am not legally authorized to give you 100% of this information. I can just show you where to look and I can try to interpret it as best I can. But again, this is something you're going to want to check out with planning and zoning to make sure that selling from your farm <clears throat> is allowable. So I know in Boise, they changed the code <clears throat> so that you can sell agricultural products that you grow on your own property, you can sell from your home as long as you don't install, um, you know, stadium lighting and a parking lot uh, and some other things like that and a huge neon sign, right? But people driving up to your door 
picking up produce or even having a little farm stand out front, as long as you're not impeding traffic or creating a hazard is allowable. So I don't know exactly what is allowable in, um, in Meridian, um, but I did look in the code and in residential zones, direct sales is allowed, right? It doesn't say of what. So I would again want to pursue that a little bit further with uh, with your commissioners of, of zoning, but you know that's what I read into it is that some sales may actually be um, perfectly fine. So all right, now we want to talk about your business name and who you are doing businesses. Okay, so if you want to operate with an, a business name, you've got a great cute name in mind, you've been saving it up, you want to make rubber stamps and start stamping bags and making signage for your business, you do need to register that name with the Idaho Secretary of State's office. Now, if you're an individual and you're just using your legal first and last name to sell your products, you do not need to file a business name. So an example, right, my name is Ariel Agenbrod. So if I call my farm, Ariel Agenbrod Fresh Produce, right? I don't need a form. I can sell with that name. If I call my farm Agenbrod's Acres, I need a form, right? Because that's a business name. It's not my first and last name. Um, I would have to have the, the permission or I'd have to have that registered. So the good thing is that it is fairly easy to do this. Um, they do recommend that you file your business name and entity type with the Secretary of State's office before engaging in business activities as that business. And you can file online for $25 and that name is yours and it's been registered and you can file manually with a paper form for $45. I'm not sure why the discrepancy is probably just a lot easier for them to use the online version, but you can do it either way. So what other rules or regulations might apply when you're selling fresh produce? So this is, you know, this is not the most fun part, but I think you'll find that overall there is um, not a whole lot that is going to affect you depending on how and where and what you sell, okay? And again, some of these things too, it's gonna to depend on if you choose to do this activity or not. So you don't have to sell your produce by weight. You can sell it by volume. You can sell it by the piece. You can sell it by the container. But if you are gonna sell any produce by the pound, you do need to have a certified scale. Uh, and to have a certified scale, it needs to have a, a, a scale that is legal for trade and has actually been certified every year by the Idaho State Department of Agriculture's Weights and Measures. Now, if you sell at farmer's markets, a lot of times on the first day of market, the weights and measures folks will come around and they'll test your scale that day. You can also take your scale down to the Idaho State Department of Agriculture building um, over there by the Idaho Botanical Garden and the old pen, if you've ever been out there down Warm Springs in Boise, um, and you can take your scale in and have it tested. Um, it's about, let's see, $6 for a 50 pound capacity or less scale and goes up from there. So buy the scale that's going to fit the, the types of things that you're going to be weighing. And again, it's just to make sure that you are giving people an honest deal, right? That your scale is measuring accurately. And especially if you sell by the pound, you want to make sure that you're not taking advantage of people or um, under, undercutting your own self, right? So it's, it's a good idea to have that scale checked. And then once you have that license, you need to display it wherever that scale is being used. So what if you wanted to sell plants, right? I mentioned that that's another little bit of layer of complexity, not difficult though. Selling plants is a lot of fun, uh, especially if you want to get in on the early markets and you don't have produce yet, but you have a lot of plant stock, can be a great way to be making some money early in the season. Um, and it's totally legal to sell plants. However, if you're gonna sell more than $500 worth of plant material, and again, this is not cut flowers. Cut flowers are not part of this. You can sell flowers all day long. This is a plant, you know, potted in a pot um, for planting. Um, so anyone engaged in propagating, growing, selling, dealing in, or importing into Idaho for sale or distribution, nursery or florist stock, must obtain a license if you're gonna sell more than $500 a year. So if you just do one plant sale for your church or your kid's school, um, and you're not gonna be selling more than $500 worth of, of plants at that sale, then you can be exempt from the license. But if you're gonna sell more than $500, you do need that annual license and it is $100. Uh, and you get that from the Idaho um, Department of Agriculture. 
And there's a form here, you can also go in and get this. The other nice thing I find that is a benefit of the nursery license is especially if you're going to be maybe, maybe you wanna do cut flowers for weddings, um, you know, maybe you want to be also buying your own plants as well as other people's plants, you often will get a wholesale discount at retailers if you have that nursery license. So it can be something that pays for itself depending on what kinds of businesses you're involved in. So if you, um, this is something interesting too, uh, at least when you live in Southwest Idaho, we are part of a quarantine region because we grow so many commercial onions uh, in this part of the state, we are trying to reduce um, and eliminate our uh, potential of getting a disease called white rot. And so because of that, we have really tight restrictions in Southern Idaho on the um, onion, leek, garlic, et cetera, plant material that can come into this part of the state. So if you've ever tried to order garlic in a catalog and it says not available for shipment to Idaho, this is why, um, because you can only grow stock in these counties that has been grown in these counties, unless it goes through a really rigorous growing out and testing process that involves um, the University of Idaho Research Lab and also the Department of Agriculture. So it's a multi-year process if you want to import, like say new garlic varieties and start to grow them. Totally possible to do and people have done it, but I just want you to be aware that you can't just um, you know, bring home garlic from the grocery store and plant it in your garden. That would be the worst thing you could do. It's actually illegal. So uh, if you are going to grow garlic and onion for sale as food, though, just make sure that you are purchasing certified stock from a reputable nursery or company and that you keep records of where you purchase that. Because I have had people at farmer's market be approached and asked, where did you buy your, your garlic bulbs? Right. Even though they're selling them for food and not for seed, they want to know where they came from. And if you say, well, I bought them from this grower and they only purchase, you know, um, garlic from Rupert, which is in the quarantine area or whatever, then we're OK. Uh, and more more fun about that is found on the Idaho Department of Agriculture's website. So you might have heard about different food safety laws and they are out there, yes, and they might impact you down the road. Um, you might have heard of FISMA or the Food Safety and Modernization Act. Um, this does regulate food from farm to fork on a national scale. And one part of that um, act is the produce safety rule, which covers most of the fruits, vegetables, nuts, herbs, and mushrooms and sprouts, especially those that we commonly consume raw. Now, the good news, I mean, I guess good news, um, Food safety is really important and it's everybody's responsibility, whether you're a small farm or a large farm, but some farms are not going to meet the sales minimums to be covered by this rule and others will qualify for an exemption based on their sales and who their customers are. So how would you know? Well, if you don't grow raw, uh, raw commodities that are consumed raw, like say you only grow sweet corn and potatoes, you're not gonna be covered by this rule. It doesn't apply to you. Uh, if you eat all the food that you grow and you don't sell anything, again, this is not going to apply to you. Um, if you grow these products and they all go into processing, like they're all going into salsa or jam or something else that has a heat treatment, again, it's not going to cover you. And then if you're just getting started and you're selling less than $25,000 every year in produce, it's not going to apply to you either. So that's good. It's really, it's really meant um, to focus on larger farms and really you know, those that are having a real big impact in the food system. However, like I said, food safety is something that everyone should be thinking about no matter their size. Now, um, what if you sell more than $25,000? Well, if you sell more than $25,000 a year in your produce, but you're still selling less than $500,000 of all the food that you sell, both covered produce, maybe jams, jellies, breads, et cetera. So if your total sales of food overall are less than $500,000 a year, and you're selling at least half of your products directly to a consumer, whether it's a farmer's market customer, whether it's a restaurant, maybe it's the Boise Food Co-op, um, that's located in the same state or not more than 270 miles from your farm, then you will qualify for a qualified exemption. So that's good to know too. So I think for the most part, you don't have to worry too much about these federal regulations until you start to really grow your business. Um, and then, then it'll, it'll just be one of those things that you've got to deal with, right? Um, and other growers are already taking care of it. 
So um, just one thing I wanted to mention, though, is that one way to stay on top of it, and if you ever get questioned to know where you stand, is you can actually download some record keeping templates and forms from our food safety website. Uh, and that way you can just document your sales records. And if anyone questions you, you can say, nope, we fall well below that minimum. Um, we're on it. We are definitely exempt. Here's, you know, here's our paperwork. Um, but one, one rule that does apply to anybody that is in that middle, middle ground is that when you are making produce sales, you need to prominently display the name and the business address of your farm, either at the place where you're selling, so at your farmstead or at the farmer's market, or putting that label on the packaging of your produce. And that's just so that they know where that produce came from. Um, if there was a problem, they could get back with you. And also really from a marketing standpoint, um, labeling your produce helps somebody to find you again when they run out and they realize how delicious it was. So labeling is always a good idea. All right, so I asked if you might want to sell organic produce. Well, there's a few things that come along with this. You can do all the right things and never use any pesticides or fertilizers, and you still can't typically call your produce organic, right? Organic is a labeling term. Um, it, is, um, it is authorized and um, certified by the Idaho State Department of Agriculture for the USDA. So um, it certifies that this agricultural product has been produced in these certain ways and it has gone through a rigorous inspection and record keeping process. So you can't just call your food organic unless there is a caveat, right? If you sell less than 500,000, let me start over again. If you sell less than $5,000 a year in produce, so you're really not selling very much, you can claim that your produce is organic without going through the certification, but you can't use the USDA organic seal or sticker and you can't call it certified organic. Um, so again, you might want to keep records of your sales because if you're, you've got a farmer's market booth and you have organic written all over the place, they're going to say, are you certified? And you say no. And they say, are you selling over $5,000? And you'll probably want to say yes or no. Now, certifying organic is a process. It's not out of the reach of folks, especially if you've got a, a customer base that really wants organic produce. Um, how do you become a certified organic? Well, it can take up to three years for your property to meet the requirements, um, depending on what's been done to that property prior and if you have records about that. So really no synthetic fertilizer or chemical um, insecticides, herbicides, et cetera, can be used on that property for three years um, in order to meet the organic certification. But if you have ground that's never had anything done with and you can document that, you might be able to expedite that process. And then if you do want to pursue this, the Idaho State Department of Agriculture, again, is your place. They really are the regulatory body for all things agriculture in our state. Um, and we're lucky that they're really close. You can just pop in if you want, or you can access almost all of their documents online. And again, um, if you like record keeping, you will love certified organic production. There is a lot of record keeping involved. But uh, again, this is an, um, an assurance to the customer that you have grown things in a certain way. And so they are really rigorous with their uh, reporting and recording. So is that everything, right? Am I ready to go? I thought about food safety. I thought about my business license. I got my seller's permit. Um, I'm good to go. So I do wanna talk about a few more things that may or may not affect you, but they're things that we really want you to um, consider as you're moving forward. Uh, so again, as you start to grow and, and increase your business and expand your diversity of your products, you might find that you're potentially wanting to add more things. Like now I want to sell lamb or eggs, or I want to you know, add in more things, or I wanna have people come to my farm and pick it and have a you pick. So anytime you do this, you're going to add potentially more regulation and requirements, not that they're, you know, overwhelming or make it impossible, but just know that there are going to be additional things you have to do. Anytime that you bring people onto your farm, make sure that you're insured for that, either through your homeowner's insurance or through an additional agritourism policy. Some homeowner's insurance companies don't understand that and they don't speak the language of agriculture. So you might look to an agricultural insurer for some of that. 
And even if people don't come to your farm, we really recommend that you get liability insurance for your products. This is going to protect you. It's going to protect your customers. Um, we live in such a litigious um, age that it's something that we really consider, think that you should consider having. And again, going through an agricultural insurer is the best way to get this because they understand what it is that you're trying to insure. And again, when you sell into a farmer's market, uh, some markets will require that you hold a liability policy to sell at their market because they don't want to be responsible for it either, right? Um, and then anytime you change your business structure, maybe you're going to go to an LLC or you're going to think about adding employees, right? That's going to require additional record keeping, different kinds of tax forms, et cetera, um, and more record keeping. Oh yeah, record keeping, right? Um, if you have not already started to keep records, it's a good time to start because this is how you keep track of things. This is how you make sure that you're making money. This is how you make sure that you're paying your taxes right and that you're staying above board with everything that you're doing. And any kind of business that you're going to go into is going to have a certain amount of record keeping. It's just part of the modern age. So records show that you properly collected, reported, and forwarded taxes. So these are some important things to keep if you are collecting sales tax. So just sort of some books of account, right? When you make sales and how much. Um, some documents that support those entries, right? So bills, receipts, invoices. If you have a cash register, keep those tapes. Um, and if you sell to any um, sales exempt organizations, then like a nonprofit or a school, you might keep those certificates too. And what else should these records show? Well, the reason that you're keeping them is you wanna show what your gross receipts and sales and services were. And this is gonna determine um, you know, what kind of tax you're going to pay. So if you sell to any customers that claim an exemption, you know, what type of exemption and what did you sell them? Any deductions that you're gonna be claiming, um, the purchase of anything that you bought related to your business, right? That you either bought to sell or rent, lease or to use for your own farm and how much sales tax collected from your customers, um, or did you pay sales tax to another vendor for a business expense? And then remember, you'll be billed the tax due if you don't keep records to explain your deductions or to explain why certain sales weren't taxed. So this can help you to overall reduce your sales tax. So how long should I keep records? Well, that's a good question, right? You must keep all sales and tax records for at least four years. And you might keep them uh, for seven years, especially if you don't file returns in case you were ever audited. Like, why doesn't she ever file returns? Well, it's just make enough money, right? That might be the case, but you want to be able to document that. So keep any records for transactions that involve sales or use tax, including your sales um, purchases, tax returns, tax payments. And then those resale or exemption certificates, keep them as long as you do business with a buyer, um, at least for four years. So get a big file, a file cabinet or a binder or something like that, or, or there's lots of ways to do this on a computer too, if you feel really comfortable doing that. So a really good place to start for getting all of this information and finding the right forms that you need. It can also be a little bit overwhelming because you might get down a rabbit hole and then wonder how you're gonna get back out. But I really found that business.idaho.gov was a good place to start. Uh, you can at least find all, you know, what you need, but give yourself some time. Uh, maybe make sure that you're nice and relaxed. Maybe you have a favorite beverage or a snack with you because it, it can get kind of anxiety causing and you can get lost and you have to backtrack and go back. Um, so th this really helped me though, because I actually went through and I did their business wizard and I, I did it as if I was going to sell produce. And it really gave me the information that I needed. It gave me more stuff than I needed, but it gave me the essentials. So business.idaho.gov, great site to get started. Um, and so after all of this, sorry, I've got a typo up there. Are you still interested, right? Have you already just like logged off and went, nope, 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 nope. Maybe you're like, I, I can still do that. That doesn't sound too bad. So I would recommend that you connect with the local farmer's market, talk to the manager, talk to some other vendors about what they do and if this is a good fit for you. And you do have your meridianmainstreetmarket.com. That's the website. And uh, last time I checked the website, it said that they were accepting new vendors. I know that most of the markets are still always looking for high quality produce vendors because people come to a farmer's market for the farm products. Um, and it's, it's you know there's, there's a lot of opportunity. 
So explore your options, you know, think about if farmer's market is really the best place to start. It might be somewhere that you eventually want to sell at, but you want to start smaller or maybe just sell to your friends and neighbors or folks from church or, you know, at work. Start small, really start small. You can always grow um, and take some time to do the math. Figure out what it costs you to produce. Figure out what you would need to sell your products for in order to break even or even to make a product a profit and make a plan and continue to learn as much as you can about this. You know, attending a one hour webinar, this is not nearly enough to really uh, get you started in the right way. And there are lots of resources, people, organizations out there that wanna help you. And so, like I said, especially for the business and tax stuff, I would uh, check into your small business development center, you know, see if there are some folks there that can help you put these pieces together. Um, I wanted to point out two resources that I have to plug, obviously, because I'm part of them, but I do think that we work really hard to make these valuable to the people of Idaho who are wanting to explore agriculture as a hobby and career. So the first one is our U of I small farms page. It's uidaho.edu slash small farms. And on this, you can find a lot of information about the different programs that we offer, our publication resources, um, and just learn more about growing and selling and participating in the local food system. We also have an offshoot of our small farms program called Cultivating Success. And this is primarily how we de deliver a lot of our courses. We have a um, great webinar, recorded webinar series with probably, I would say, close to three dozen webinars now on everything related to small acreage farming and ranching in Idaho. And they're all available on the website on demand. You can watch them at any time. Some of them have worksheets or handouts associated with them. Um, so I really recommend that you check out cultivatingsuccess.org. We have a, a Washington program and an Idaho program. The Idaho program is awesome. And uh, we would love to have you check out some of those resources. So that's really all I had today to introduce you to some of the basic considerations when you want to grow produce and sell it as a small business. Um, you might have many more questions than I was able to answer today, but I encourage you to reach out to us in extension, reach out to your library professionals if you need help doing research or navigating technology, and to also think about going through your small business development center, especially if you need help with some of those legalities, taxes, business structure, etc. So thank you so much for joining us, and I look forward to seeing you at market. Awesome. Thank you.